you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in a couple places today. Uh, we're going to be, we're going to start in the gospel, I'm sorry, the letter, the epistle of John, toward the back, 1 John 3. We're going to really spend most of our time in the book of Ephesians, uh, so if you want to flip there as well, uh, we're going to pull in a couple passages uh, from Revelation, they'll all be there in front of you. If you don't have a Bible and you want to follow along, there's one in front of you there as well. So when God called me to the ministry way back in 1992, uh, I said I'm going to be a lifer when it comes to student ministry. That's where I felt called to. Uh, 85% of the people who come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior do so by the age of 18. So that was kind of the fertile ground. Um, I loved hanging out with young people. Uh, I felt like that was my life's calling. Uh, but I was in a place where I was able to preach fairly regularly and uh, I realized that this is something I felt called and and really enjoy doing, and I started a desire to shepherd people that beyond one age group. And so, with about 10 years of ministry experience, uh, I began pursuing uh, a call as a lead pastor, as a senior pastor, uh, and I remember sitting in front of a search committee, um, this is again probably like 2001 or two, and I remember a search committee member asking me a great question, uh, what kind of church would you like to pastor? And I gave them my answer pretty quickly. I said, I'd like to pastor a church like Ross Dress for Less. It makes sense, right? And they looked at me like I'd lost my mind, which you guys know I have, right? And they're like, Ross Dress for Less? I mean, what kind of church you want to pastor? Why in the world would you say Ross Dress for Less? A what? I said, well, when I go to Ross Dress for Less, I find that that's the place that most resembles what I see in Scripture is God's family, especially toward the end of the story. Because when I go to Ross Dressless, I see white people, I see black people, I see Hispanic people, I see Asian people. They all gather there. How do they figure that out? When I go to Ross Dress for Less, I see people that look like they have money. I have people who maybe don't. I see an economic range a little bit there at Ross Dress for Less. They all seem to be going there. And to me, as I think of the church, I want to pastor a church that kind of reflects where the church in glory is going to be, uh, what it's going to look like. And as we get to the end of God's story, we see that the family of God includes, this is incredible, it's every tribe, it's every tongue, it's every people. I mean, that God loves the world he's created, he red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. I'm not sure that's politically correct anymore to say those kind of things, but I love the reality of what scripture says is God's family is this beautiful variegated color. It's this beautiful goo of humanity from all over that, that if you think that we look just a certain way, you're not really seeing the family photo. And many times we look at the family photo, we only see just a slice of it. But we got to look into God's word. This morning, we're going to begin a new sermon series. It's going to be five weeks. I'm so excited about it. It's called We Are Family. Uh, we are family of God. And we're going to talk about our worship and our witness. Because we are God's family, it affects the way we worship. And because we are family, it affects our witness in the world. And what does that look like? So for the next five weeks, uh, it's going to be more topical. Uh, most times I preach through a sermon series. Uh, it's going to be going through a book, uh, kind of diving deep. We're going to be diving deep topically. And what I love about this series, it's, it's going to be a tag team effort. Uh, Charlie Woodward's going to be preaching a couple of, of these weeks, and I'll be preaching some as well. But according to God's word, according to God's word, those of us who are in Christ Jesus, it's a very important phrase, in Christ Jesus. It's those who have placed their faith and their trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Scripture says that, that, that those are the ones who are in Christ. Now, it's interesting to note, it doesn't mean that church membership gets you into Christ. It doesn't mean that things like the sacraments get you into Christ. Oh, those, those things are important and good. The only way that we are in Christ is by God's grace through faith that we've placed in him. And if we are in Christ, 
we are a part of God's family, no matter who you are, no matter how young, no matter how old, no matter how rich, no matter how poor, no matter what tone your skin is, no matter where you grew up, if you are in Christ, you are in God's family. And being a part of God's family, it really uh, should bring great blessing, and it does every day. But it also brings great responsibility. What does it mean to represent the family, God's family in this world? So that's what we're going to be unpacking for the next five weeks. This is critical for us as a fairly new church to, know, to make sure we know what does this family dynamics look like for us. So we're going to look at three things this morning. The first one is this, we are the family of God. The second one is this, we are the blended family of God. And then thirdly, we are the family of God on earth. Uh, really meaning that some of our family members are in glory, aren't they? Uh, some of them are already home, uh, but we are uh, the family of God here on earth. And so we're going to start by reading 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. Um, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. And by the way, this is going to be different than I typically preach. I typically read through scripture, and then I uh, preach through that passage. Uh, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read just a couple of verses here in 1 John, and then for each point of scripture, I'm going to read that passage and unpack it for you. So it's a little bit different. Those of you who follow along, uh, those kind of things, just a little bit of heads up. But out of reverence for God's word and the reality that this is, we're just looking at a couple of verses here. Would you stand with me to hear the reading of God's word in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2? Hear the word of the Lord. See what kind of love the Father has lavished or given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us, it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will uh, be has not yet appeared. But we know that when Jesus appears, when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself, for he is pure. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You see, the, let, me, let, me, let me pray for us. Father God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The thought that we are your family, the thought that you could lavish a love on us that great is absolutely astounding. O Spirit of God, be with us. Be with the preaching of your word. And Father, may there not be a soul here that's with us or watching that isn't a part of that family. Maybe today is going to be a homecoming. But for those of us who are already in the family, may it be a phenomenal reminder of what is our responsibility? What is our response to being in this family? Oh God, do that which only you could do. Speak through a broken sinner. And God, give us ears to hear your voice, minds to understand, hearts to embrace, and feet to walk in a manner worthy of your children. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The first thing we're going to see is that we are this family of God. I love the way 1 John is going to say it to us, that, that God has lavished love upon us. He's poured it upon us, that we should be called the children of God. But I want you to hear how Paul will address the church in Ephesus, how he describes who we are in Christ Jesus. And again, we are the family of God. Hear the word of the Lord, Ephesians 1. I'm going to read 3 through 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Even as he, the Father, chose us in him, the Son, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness 
of trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Well, one thing is clear is you don't choose your family. You were born into a family. You don't choose your family. You don't get that right. You just came into this world, and guess what? You had a family. And if that family wasn't able to care for you or nurture you or keep you, uh, you would become possibly an adopted uh, child. But again, you don't choose your adopted family. They choose you, except for maybe Charlie, who, uh, you know, he was involved in that, and he certainly chose back that family. But here's the reality is God is the one who initiates, right? I mean, God is the one who chooses his family. And it's very interesting. Did you hear when God did the choosing of his family? Now, God is creator of all things. All Everyone ever born is made in his image. But not everybody that is born is a part of his family. There are some that are and some that aren't. But it says that before time began, it says before the foundation of the world, God set a love upon his family. He chose us in Christ Jesus. Absolutely incredible. God had a plan for his family, his family, and it was from the very, very beginning. How much does God love family? Wow. Before he even created, he loved. And he loved us, and he says, I'm going to love them so much, I'm going to make them mine. The Father chose us. He not only chose us, but it says very specifically, he chose us in Christ. So he says, I'm going to make them my family, but the conduit, uh, the, the one who's going to pull them into the family is going to be my son. So they're my chosen family, but watch this, they're my family in Christ. Why? Because all of God's blessings flow through his son. You're not going to find a blessing from God that doesn't come through the son. Look at what verse 3 says again, that all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms are ours. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in the heavenly realms with all the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And so in Christ Jesus, here comes these blessings of the Father, and in Christ Jesus comes the blessing of this Father's choosing of us in Christ. In Christ. And what does that mean? Well, he chose us in Christ, in Jesus' life, in his death and resurrection, we could be brought into the family. So he begins with God. God's the one who chooses his family. Uh, we are the family. God was the chooser of that. But it says more than that, he adopted us into the family of, of God. And I love the fact that we are going to be adopted. He's going to use the phrase in love, that God the Father adopted us in love. Now you can say, well, that's kind of redundant. God is love. Yes, but you know, it wasn't duty. He didn't owe it to us. Uh, it wasn't something that he was obligated. Okay, I'll make them mine. All right, I'll get them over here. No, that before time began, God knew you. He knew that what a knucklehead you and I are. Uh, but at the same time, he loved us. And he'll never stop. And so in this love, I mean, that is the catalyst. He is going to adopt us as his own. Now, hit pause on that. Just, just think about it. God is holy. God is sinless. God is perfect. And the mystery to me is God loves sinners. I mean, he doesn't love us when we clean up. He doesn't love us uh, because we've made ourselves good enough. He loves us. And scripture will say he even demonstrates his own love for us that while we're still sinners, he would send his son for us. God's amazing love for sinners. And then he says this, he adopted us to be sons through Jesus Christ. Now, ladies, you might be sitting there thinking, oh, that's sexist. I mean, real nice. He adopted me to be a son. I mean, what about a daughter? We just sang we are sons and daughters of the king. It's true. I'm going to unpack a little bit more about this in a minute. But I want you to know something, ladies, that God made male and female in his image. We have equal standing before God. But when this was written, for God to say you are an adopted son of mine is incredibly wonderful. It's not being sexist. God is saying, I'm not going to make a distinction between a female and a male. All the blessings that come to the sons, that was that culturally at that time, 
I'm going to pour through to each one of you. I'm going to treat you like a son. I'm going to treat you like a beloved son. I'm going to treat you like my beloved son in Christ Jesus. All the blessings that come through my son, I'm going to give to you, male or female. So don't be hung up that it says, well, I'm an adopted son. Darn it, I want to be adopted daughter. No, in this context, you want to be an adopted son because all the blessings flow to you. And not only that, it's according to God's plan. I love this. If you're ever wondering, does God, is he, is he, does he have a plan? For those of you who are detailed in nature, God bless you. I don't understand you. I wish I was. For those of you who love dotting your I's and crossing your T's, blessings to you. It's a gift from God. But let me tell you something about God. He had a plan. It says he predestined us. This is his plan for adoption. And he did it according to the purpose of his will. I love it. Why did God do it? Well, it's according to the purpose of his will. He's the wonderful counselor. He knows all things. He didn't have to ask anybody else, hey, do you think it's a good idea that I adopt these people? Hey, do you think it's a good idea? What do you all think? No, no, no. This is God's eternal plan. This is God's eternal action. Uh, This is what he desired to do from the very beginning. He wants you to be close. He wants you to be his. And he wants you to know how loved you are. And it was always according to his plan. Now think, think about your life. Think of how you've meandered all over the place. Think of the times you've lived your life and you didn't think anything of God. Think of the times in your life you've rebelled against God. Think of the times you've lived your life as if you were an atheist, as if there was no God. And yet, before time began, God says, I love you. I've chosen you. You're going to be mine. I'm going to make sure it happens. I'm going to set the perfect time. I'm going to soften your heart. I'm going to give you the grace and the faith that you need to embrace me, to be a part of this family. I want you to know that there's not one person in heaven that God's wringing their hand thinking, oh, man, gee, I I really hope that they're, they're going to get it. I hope that they're the ones who are going to soften their hearts. We pray for the loved ones, and we beg God, saying, God, please. But we know at the same time that our God is good, and our God's got a plan. And somehow it's included us. And it's all by his grace. So we are that adopted family of God. But he adopted us for a reason, to the praise of his glorious grace. I love this, to the praise of his glorious grace. We have been adopted to worship him for his praise, for his glory, right? I mean, we are, we are his for him. <laughs> he does this. And the greatest thing, that, this is going to be a hard statement for some to understand, but God will always act for his glory. And as God acts for his glory, he acts for our good. We think it sounds selfish, but no, it's not. If God didn't act for his glory, he'd be an idolater. But for the praise of his glorious grace, he adopted us, um, and and he's adopted us to worship God. I mean, that's why he's brought us into the family. Okay, so we are the chosen family of God. We are the adopted family of God. Man, I got some stuff for you this morning, so I hope you're ready. We are the rescued family of God. Right? I mean, before time began, he loved us and he chose us, but now he had to make us his own. Uh, he, had to, he, he had to clean us up. Uh, so what is this? We're the rescued family of God. It talks in this passage that we have redemption purchased through, the, through Christ's blood. So in Christ Jesus, not only are we chosen, but we're brought in, we're rescued. That in Christ Jesus, the forgiveness of sins. We just celebrated Easter. We just celebrated Holy Week. And the reality that how did we have our sins forgiven? Christ made a sacrifice on the cross for them so the holy God can accept that sacrifice. That empty tomb declares that our sins have been banished from us as far as the east is from the west. I know we still wrestle with sin. I know there's still a struggle for us. But in Christ, not some of our sins, all of them have been paid. Think about that for a minute. Everything that you've done wrong, everything you're doing wrong, everything that you will do that's a mess and broken and selfish and wrong, Christ paid for all of it. It's incredible. That's his powerful blood. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. your, Your sins have been separated from you as far as the east is from the west. We are the rescued family of God. And again, it's according to the riches of his grace which he's lavished upon us. None of us deserve it. It's grace, grace, grace that we have it. And I love it. How does he give us grace? A little bit thimble full at a time? No. He opens up the floodgates. He lavishes upon us his 
grace to choose us, to cleanse us. And I think when it says that we are the rescued family of God, this is important for us to know. It's really saying this, that we are the illegally adopted family of God. Everything that was required from a holy God, from a just God, from a just judge, for us to be his, and for him to maintain his holiness and justice, Christ has done. So legally, we could stand before God and be declared his children. You know, you know when a judge declares a child legally a part of the family, that's binding. And so now we know that we have been rescued and legally declared in the ultimate court of heaven to be his. Don't lose that. Don't lose family. Not only that, we're the enlightened family of God. Certain things belong just to the family. Not necessarily family secrets, though you might have some of those, but there's certain things that the family knows that other people don't. And God has revealed to us his plan for the world. He's making known to us the mystery of his will. It says it in verses 9 and 10, that in Christ, God the Father is uniting all things, reconciling all things in heaven and earth. Here's what he's saying. Okay, my son, I'm going to reconcile all things in heaven and earth through Christ Jesus. This is my will. And being part of God's family have implications for today. Christianity is not just that we have a home to go to once we pass. Christianity and being a part of God's family is that we have work to do today to be a witness. Because what God is doing in the world is taking his son and he's uniting heaven and earth. That's why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Right? And so that's what we are doing. We're making known that mystery. And we are not just the uh, family of God. We are the blended family of God. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, uh, I'm going to pick up uh, in verse 11. Um, again, 1 through 10 will tell us again how we become the children of God. But I'm going to read uh, 11 through 17. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at a time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, this is Jesus, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinance that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to those who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to one spirit, to the Father. This is really what's it's saying, is that we are this incredible blended family of God. Well, the Jakeses, we got a new family member this week. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, we got a new family member uh, right there, Ruby. Uh, Easter Sunday came, Monday came, what do you do? You get a new dog, especially when you have two other dogs, right? So we got Ruby, but it wasn't just my family crazy. My sons also got dogs. So we have three uh, golden retrievers, and then, thank God they're not all living in our house. But um, anyway, new family. We are now a new blended dog family. We had two other dogs in our family, and we welcome Ruby home. And I'm telling you, my other dogs are all out of sorts. I, mean, I got one brown dog. She looks like a, 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 a chocolate lab and uh, a great little dog named Zoe, which in Greek means life. And Zoe uh, is much bigger, but Zoe is like, she sees the new puppy and she just starts like <laughs> drooling. I mean, she's drooling all over the place. I don't know what that's all about, but, but cannot go anywhere near her, runs the opposite way. You're like her life is out of sorts. I mean, she is... She, she stopped eating. If you knew Zoe, Zoe doesn't stop eating. That's one thing she, I, I, I relate with her. She loves to eat. I love to eat. All of a sudden, she's not eating. I'm like, you are out of sorts. Why? Because we are trying to blend our family. 
And let me tell you what is happening here is that we are part of a blended family. Uh, many people read the Old Testament and say this family of God is a Jewish family. You know, we are not Jewish. We're Gentiles. But God is saying, hey, there's a family history here. There's a family history here, um, and this family of God started long before you and I became a part of it, right? Started before time began, but here we are in the picture. At one time, the picture of God's family looked quite Jewish and, and, or Israeli and, and their, their makeup. Uh, they were, in the beginning, seemingly the only ones in the photo. Uh, but then in Christ Jesus, these Gentiles, uh, these Gentiles, they're called the uncircumcised here. You know what they're also called? Dogs. I mean, it's incredible. So you had this family picture, the family history that God came to people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. But by the way, the whole world's going to be blessed through you. And the whole world's going to come to me through the blessings that I give to you. And so now we see this blended family. Now you've got to understand, the New Testament, this was rocking their world. Wait a minute. Jesus didn't come just for the Jews? Wait a minute. God's family includes Gentiles? Wait a minute. This isn't some ethnic thing? This isn't some cultural thing? That God's family is bigger than all of this? Yes. We are a part of a history. Uh, one time we were separated from Christ and the promises of Christ. One time it says that we were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. And what this is saying is God, a long time ago, came and made a family out of people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, he made promises to them. He says that we're strangers of the covenant of promise. He made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He made a covenant with David that out of his family line, there'll always be a king. He made a covenant with Jeremiah. But it says at one time you were apart from them. At one part, you, you, they weren't connected to you. And it says this, you were hopeless and godless. Apart from these, you're hopeless and godless. But now you've been brought near. Here's the point. We're the church, we're part of God's family, but that Old Testament and all the people you read about, guess what? That's family. Those who have braced Christ, uh, the Savior that would come, we're going to see them. And those promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're ours, because uh, they're fulfilled in Christ Jesus. We read through Scripture. Don't read your Old Testament thinking that's the old God who was angry, that dealt with Israel one way, and now he's dealing with the church another way. That's wrong way of reading the Bible. This is one story of God, and we have one story family history. It starts with Abraham. It goes through Noah. It's beautiful. It's incredible. But we have a family builder, and our family builder's name is Jesus. Christ Jesus has brought us into family. He's brought us near by the blood of Christ. Jesus is our peace, it says. We have peace with God and peace with one another. Do we have peace between Republicans and Democrats right now? Have you ever seen more angry people politically? I mean, is our world more at divide than you've seen it right now? This is what it was like with the Jews and the Gentiles. They didn't like each other. They didn't eat with each other. They didn't talk to each other. They didn't hang out with each other. You know, they were the other people. They were the bad side. They're the dark side. Wait a minute. Jesus is bringing them here? Are you kidding me? They're part of our family? I mean, don't they have to be circumcised? Don't they have to be Jewish? Don't they have to follow the law? Well, how, how do they get here? It's us, by the way. We got there through Christ. Jesus is the peace. He's the one who says, I'm going to take those who are separated and make them one. I'm going to knock down the dividing wall and make them one family. And then we see our family unity. It says, I love this. Jesus makes a new man out of two. He takes two, Jew and Gentile, and he makes them one. It's always been God's plan that we are one family. Listen to Galatians 3, verse 28. In Christ Jesus, there's not a Jew nor a Gentile. There's neither a slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What is this saying? God's family is not based on ethnicity. It's not based on gender. It's not based on economic status or even religious heritage. God loves us and makes us his own. But then we see the family diversity. Revelation 5, 9 and 10 says this. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy 
are you, Jesus, to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you've ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've done more. You've made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. It's raw stress for us. It's raw stress for us. It's a church. Every tribe, tongue, and nation. A diverse kingdom of priests. But he says, you shall reign for God on earth. And lastly, we are the family of God on earth now. And verses 18 through 22 is going to remind us that we are connected with him. Let me read that real quick. Ephesians chapter 2, 18. For through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you've also been built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Oh, I hope you heard those words. We are, right now, family, right now, church, we're a colony of heaven on earth. Did you hear that? That's what we are. We're God's people here on earth. We're fellow citizens, it says, with the saints in heaven. We're members of God's household. We are the holy temple in the Lord. We're the place where God is to be worshipped. We don't have to go to Jerusalem or Mecca or any other place. We're it. We're the place of the temple of God. We're the dwelling place for God. We're the place where God is to be witnessed and to be seen because God dwells with his people. And what is God doing? He's uniting all things in heaven and earth in Christ. And he's doing it through the church, through his family. My last passage is Ephesians 3, 8 through 10. To him, Paul writes, though I'm the very least of, these, of, of the saints, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden in the ages who created all things. So here's what he says. So that through the family of God, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is what it's saying. King's Chapel. It's through us, the church, that God wants to tell his story. It's through us through our worship of God, through our witness of God. The most important question as we close, are you in the family picture? I just gave you a ton of information, I know. But are you in the family picture? That's the most important. And the question is, are you in Christ Jesus? Is he your Lord and Savior? If so, celebrate being a part of the family. It should impact the way you worship, not just here on Sunday mornings, but every day. Take seriously our responsibility. You are his witnesses. You are his ambassadors. This week, you represent our God and his family values, our witness, and the way that you should love one another should proclaim the reality that he is real. We are family, God's family. May it impact our worship and our witness. It's so important for us to know this, especially as a young church, for the glory of our great God, for the good of our neighbor. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Father God, I thank you so much that we have the joy of being a part of your family. Oh, it's so incredible. It's so, so much grace. Oh God, how could you love us the way you do? And Jesus, we thank you that you're the cornerstone. You're the one who is building this family. And you're the one who's the glue that holds us all together. But it all starts with the Father, the way he loves us. And God, I pray for anyone here this morning that maybe they're moral and religious, but they're just not yours. They're just not in Christ Jesus. That today would be the day that they would realize the only way they get in the family photo is by embracing Jesus as Lord and Savior. Confessing their sins and holding in faith onto a Savior, your Son. And God, for those of us who are yours, we thank you that we're in the photo. We don't deserve to be, but we're in that incredible family photo of God in Christ Jesus. And God, 
It should impact our lives. We should now be a living sacrifice. Everything we do should say family, family of God. Oh God, I thank you that you are so loving and so gracious and so slow to anger because really we act more like disobedient children than anything. But God, your grace and mercy are even greater. Oh God, may King's Chapel take seriously the call to be your family and our worship and witness, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.